professional singing career spanning almost four decades, Dave Bartram was the charismatic frontman and voice synonymous with the 70s and 80s hit makers Shawari Wari. Dave has written two books for Phantom, The Boys of Summer, and All Mapped Out, which have been born out of his time on the road. Amusing episodes of his life, you might say. Here to tell all is the man himself, Dave Bartram, as part of our Authors in Lockdown series. Dave, welcome. How are you? Yeah, not too bad under the circumstances. It's, uh, we, we do live in uh, the overworked word at the moment is unprecedented times, isn't it? But uh, it really is. It's, uh, it's astonishing. But uh, my, my wife and I, we're, uh, we're treating it with you know, a certain amount of alacrity and just getting on with it. And um, in, in some ways, it's, it's kind of relaxing. And you go out for your daily walks and people are actually very, very pleasant. There seems to be a total shift in attitudes. It does, and I rather hope that stays, to be honest with you. And um, nice to see that you've been staying fairly safe and well, although I'm, I'm looking at your, your arm there. It doesn't look terribly... Uh, I hope that's not too painful. Well, I was... Uh, the first day of uh, lockdown, which I think was the 23rd of March officially, um, which is actually my, my birthday, which you believe. And um, I, I was doing some silly exercises. Still, uh, I still consider myself a bit, a bit of a, a, a child in that respect. Um, was doing some exercise and something went crunch and it was my wrist although obviously with the writing and all the time spent at the computer the the, the, the wrist probably takes the brunt of of, uh, of any injuries in in the arm but um yeah suddenly it's uh, i've got past the really painful sort of spell now so which is a heck of a relief but uh, did have quite a number of sleepless nights to uh, to also distract me from the lockdown well, not the right way to be distracting you, I don't think, but uh, glad to hear that you're hopefully on the mend and uh, uh, hopefully uh, it, doesn't in, it doesn't stop you from uh, doing too much in the way of writing. We'll cover that in a little bit more detail later on. Um, life on the road and being part of a, of a successful group, um, where did it all start for you? Oh, crikey, I was very musical right from uh, the work over oh, uh, six years of age, I think. I was, I was in a, a Scouts gang show uh, and was the only cub who was sort of sneered at by the by the the, the older scout boy scouts in their in their uniforms. But um, yeah, this this little sort of bratish lad um, had in, invaded onto their space, and um, I did little bits of acting and stuff like that, and then started singing and found that I could just about carry a tune. And um, well, I suppose as you could say, the rest is history. <laughs> it is history. How did that, um, how did the fateful meeting all come together for you for Shuari Wadi? Well, I, I was performing in a band that were called Choice, spelt with uh, an S. We used to use the S at dollar sign, which was quite quirky at that time. Um, four piece band. And we played a, a, a resident gig on the outskirts of Leicester, a place called the Fosway Hotel, which, um, which now is actually a, a very half decent. Um, Indian restaurant, but uh, in those days, the Fos Fosway Hotel was uh, one of the sort of better venues in and around Leicester. And we had a residency there, and we played there three, three nights a week. And um, we had a, a big following of, of our own as choice, and wrote a lot of songs, and uh, went out doing the air bases up and down the country, and ultimately turned professional. And uh, after a year, uh, of being professional, um, we teamed up with uh, some other guys who used to come along and watch us at the Fosway, and we did a bit of a jam. And there seemed to be a little bit of chemistry there. And um, you know, once again, we, we just we tried to put this sort of extravaganza together, this rock and roll extravaganza. And we were all keen rock and roll fans. Um, they were sort of the quickest songs to learn, if you like, the Eddie Cochran, Come On Everybody, things like that. And within no time, we got half a dozen songs together and aired these to the, uh, the fans that used to go along to our, our gigs at the Fosway. And all of a sudden, they were going potty. It, it, it was unbelievable. The, the reaction was just quite extraordinary. Um, within six months, we formed Shawadi Wadi. And... Um, got signed very, very quickly. The record companies were, were fighting over it. It was something different. We performed on 
um, ATVs, uh, new faces, which I suppose is kind of the Britain's got talent of its day. And um, the, the phone lines were just red hot. And you know, the masses just seemed to, to like what we were doing. And consequently, uh, that sort of turned into a recording career. And as soon as we had singles out, we found ourselves in the dizzy heights of the, of the top five. And playing top of the pops. Yeah, many, many times. I think we're, we're actually, I think we're listed as um, fourth in the, the number of actual uh, live appearances on, on top of the pops. I think Cliff Richard holds the record, but, uh, but we're there on fourth, but what I think shaking Stevens, and I can't remember who else in between. Well, I'll admit to you that the very first single that I, um, that I ever bought was, uh, was a Shawadiwadi single, in actual fact, and it was Under the Moon of Love in 1976. So um, well, there's, there's a connection there. <laughs> well, you could sit that on the Antiques Roadshow and get a few quid for it. <laughs> I need to get it down from the loft. I'm not entirely sure where it is at the moment, but um, uh, vinyl, uh, a resurgence in vinyl as well, which has been quite, um, which has been quite amazing to me. I mean, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, people were ditching vinyl left, right and centre. Now, all of a sudden, you buy things on vinyl, you don't buy them on CD anymore. It, it is true. Uh, we actually, the band actually, uh, with Demon Records, we recently released uh, an anthology of um, 12 albums uh, in, in vinyl. It's an absolutely beautiful collection. And I actually gifted one to a close friend of mine who still plays vinyl. He's very much a traditionalist. And he was absolutely overjoyed, which was wonderful because I, I don't think he actually bought many of our records in the day. Uh, but um, but no, he was overjoyed, and he, he was phoning me up and he'd say, "Oh crack, I didn't know you wrote songs like that, and all sad songs, weepies, and all that sort of stuff." He said, "This is incredible." So you know, it, and I'm very proud of it. It's a, it's a beautiful piece of work, actually. So that, that, that was very very exciting. And um, I suppose. Uh, the next obvious question for you is what, what inspired you to start to, I suppose, write or what, what, what inspired you to write about the, um, your experiences, I suppose, on the road? Yeah, it, it's, it's an odd one. I had done little bits of writing over the years for magazines and, and stuff, you know, all, all related to, to music uh, and actually, and, and some to, to travel with you. Really. So the... The, the idea of a, a traveling band and music sort of, I, I suppose, lent itself to, to going about, well, trying to put a book together uh, about my travels. And, uh, and the first book, The Boys of Summer, I thought I'd just test the water and, and, and rather than uh, go, go through this sort of epic sort of 39-year um, career on the road, I, I just focused on, on a, um, a seven-week period during 2005, when by which time you know, the, the, the band's sort of glory days were well past, but um, still had a, had a great following. But um, as, as the, the band's manager as well, I allowed something to slip through the net, uh, which was a seven-week tour of uh, car uh, caravan parks. I can't, I can't actually mention <laughs> the, the, the name <laughs> for, for legal reasons. But um, it was just one of those tours where everything that could go wrong did go wrong. It, it was an extraordinary seven week period. I, I lost my mother during that period, you know, which was extremely sad. And it was, you know, I, I wasn't there to hold her hand you know, during, the, during her final hours. But, um, but it was just one of those periods of, of your life where, I don't know, for some reason, we just couldn't seem to do a thing right. So, some of the, some of the shows went, went very, very well in, the, in sort of the better prepared venues, but uh, some of the venues sort of, let's say, weren't really up to scratch. And as I say, had, uh, had been allowed to, to rather slip through the net. But, um, but the stories to go with it were also pretty extraordinary. Um, you know, myself uh, dancing on stage, we would always invite a few people to join us up on stage. And I invited some kids up on stage and was totally embarrassed halfway through this dance when I realized that uh, the lad that I got sat on my knee was actually a midget. <laughs> and not a child at all. But, um, 
and he proceeded to to do a handstand across the across the stage, which um, well it, it led to a rapturous applause from the audience. Uh, and there's, there's, there were just so many stories during that tour that, that as I say, were, were just totally wild. And I, I thought, you know, that, you know that, that has got to go into print. You know, these stories have to be told. And going out with friends, I also realised long ago that um, there's so much interest in, shall we call them rock and roll tales? And um, I just found that people were really warm to these to these tales. Obviously, they, they all like to know who you who you rub shoulders with and mixed with. Um, but at the same time, there are just so many hilarious and just crazy stories that they, they really needed to be seen in print. I mean, it sounded like a really great idea. Um, get yourself a really nice booking like that. Take you through a summer season of some sort, and then you don't really know what you're landing into and I'm assuming each camp has it had its own difficulties every time you arrived there. Um, that's putting it mildly. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, I mean there, there were so many restrictions. Obviously with, with sort of name bands there, there are always these riders and stuff that, that go out you know ahead of you but um, not many of this sort of technical requirements, requirements were uh, really adhered to. And it did create a number of issues, and also a little bit of tension with the staff who figured sort of having a big name band in these caravan parks. And I, I don't know, they kind of, they, they were very defensive, they were um, quite hostile towards us, and um, it, it certainly was well, an extraordinary sort of seven week period. It, 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 it was just, as I say, one of those periods where just everything, everything went wrong. It, there weren't many pleasant experiences du during that trip, apart from the actual traveling side of it. When um, you know, I did go to some some other places, uh, St David's, the city, which stood me in good stead from a second book, all mapped out, which is about um, my visits to every city in the United Kingdom. So, uh, so that was another one to chalk off. But, uh, but yeah, it, yeah, it, 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 it was. I, I wrote it very, very lightheartedly. And, you know, it wasn't really dis disrespectful to the people that had employed us, but, um, but you know, some of, the, some of the venues did leave a lot to be decided, and, decided and, and that, as I say, was putting it mildly. And I'm sure that the accommodations weren't up to very much either if you were staying over. <laughs> no, I was, I was quite fortunate. Uh, I, I, I don't know why the, the lads saw this. I think they were self-managing the band as well. Um, I got kind of special treatment, but I know I did see some of the lads in some of the caravans. And so some of the beds, were, they weren't even as large as cots. You know, they were about this wide. So uh, you know, if, if, you, if you put a few pounds on and the love handles were protruding, you know, you, you, you would struggle to get into one of these beds. Quite bizarre. Um, and actually, towards the end of the, of the trip, we, we did actually say, look, we're going to book a few hotels and uh, just so that we could, we, we were getting a bit ragged around the edges, should I say. So uh, we decided to have a little bit of comfort towards the end of the trip. Not quite the rock and roll lifestyle that everybody thinks it is, eh? No, no, the less, uh, yeah, the less glamorous side of rock and roll for sure. <laughs> and you've alluded to the second book, um, which was all mapped out. And... You know, Truro to Hull to St David's, obviously a nice little, nice little city down in the um, down in the furthest reaches of West Wales. There, obviously, being yes. part of a big band, you've travelled a hell of a lot. So, you know, I suppose yeah. it's kind of nice to be able to tell some of those stories as well. I think I mentioned at the beginning of the, of the book that uh, I think we've done something in excess of two million miles on the road, which is, you know, it's <laughs> quite astonishing. Um, just extraordinary to, you know, the, the, I, I found when I started writing the book that there were actually only two cities in the United Kingdom that I hadn't, hadn't visited. One was pretty close to me at Litchfield and, um, I, I, and the other one was actually St David's way out in, way out west in, in Wales. But yes. um, but yeah, we, yeah I, I managed to, uh, to visit that. It's more like a, a village to be honest than a, than a city. Well, a very, very pleasant place with a, a, an ancient cathedral that is almost the size of the rest of the town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
it is a beautiful yeah, little place. Yeah, it's it's a it's a very very nice part of the world. It's a beautiful part of the world. I mean, when you go up the sort of Gower Peninsula uh, and and that sort of to, to Pe Pembrokeshire, and it's, it's it is a lovely part of the world. Very unspoiled beaches. Yeah, breathtaking. That that, that is the really beautiful part of Wales for me. And not only do you get to see some of the really nice sites, and I'm sure you've seen some beautiful places as you've travelled around, but I'm sure you've seen some not so good places, not so nice places. Oh, there's a few of those in the mix as well, yeah, for, for sure. Um, yeah, the, we all have our favourite cities and towns. Uh, Bath, I, I love as a city. It's a, it's a place where I always feel very, very comfortable. It, it doesn't seem to, to have the sort of city centre uh, louts and, and, and drunks around when you when you're out out at night, um, but there there are some pretty awful cities. I, I think the city that, that came out um, where I, I was pretty scathing about it was Armar in, in Northern Ireland, which uh, I, I found a very hostile welcome when I started asking questions about the town because obviously to, you know to put together a book you, you need a bit of inside info. But everyone seems so, so hostile. And, you know, why do you need this information? And, and there, there are actually two cathedrals there, although I, I did find out that one of them isn't officially a cathedral. But, um, but I don't know. It, it, you, you mentioned that uh, which one is the real cathedral? And, and they want to go to war with you. <laughs> but, uh, it, no, that, that, that was perhaps my, my least favourite city, although, you know, again, there are areas of, of Ireland, you could go up to the Giants uh, Causeway, and, you know, I've been very, very fortunate in, in the respect that I, I have travelled all, all over Britain, and there's some stunning stuff out there. Life on the road, people think life on the road is a very glamorous thing and, and when, you, when you're hitting high miles and you're not really sort of, you're staying in different hotels, people think, oh, that's the real high life. It's far from it, but you must have some really good memories of being on the road. Yeah, there's some, some wonderful, I, th I think the, the good memories far outweigh the, uh, the, the bad ones, obviously. Uh, I, I say that expression again, ragged around the edges, when you're touring, so, sometimes, Touring can be so, so arduous that you are literally dead on your feet. Um, but you know, it, it happens, and I think it, it toughens you up. Um, we, we took a, we've taken a lot of people on the road with us, as road crew do, or doing various uh, jobs throughout the years. You know, and they're on the road for a month, and they just don't understand how you do it. And the amazing thing was that it, even towards sort of the the sort of 35th, 40th year on the road, I, 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 for some reason, I, I just seem physically to get stronger and stronger. Um, it's, it's a fantastic way to make a living. And, and you know, that, that is the real plus point. You know, I was just absolutely privileged to, to be in a name band on the road for nearly 40 years. Uh, to meet some extraordinary people, three of the Beatles, Bing Crosby, all sorts of people over the years that, they get mentions in, in all mapped out. But, um, it, you know, I look back and I, I just think it was such a, such a privilege. And my wife and I were watching a movie the other night and um, there was a section from the movie Grease, uh, Lady Newton, John and John Travolta. And I just sat and reminisced just for a moment and I actually thought, our album, not Grease, off of number one. And I just thought, you know, it wasn't a bad old career, you know. It's good. If you can look back on it and say, that's how it was, then that's got to be it. That's got to be a good way to have spent your life, isn't it, really? Many, many, many highs. And just the odd low. But the lows keep you human. That's life, isn't it, at the end of the day? Yeah. What next for you, Dave? Uh, I'm currently just adding the finishing touches to my first work of fiction, a novel which again is, is about the music industry. It's, you would kind of call it a, a rock and roll murder mystery. So that's been, that's been a challenge. Uh, and actually, but I started writing it um, around about four, five years ago. And about 18 months in, I completely scrapped the whole project and went back. I, I like the storyline that I got and a lot of the ideas that I got. But for some reason, um, turning my 
focus on a, a work of fiction uh, was it was a totally different challenge and um, and I, I feel now that I've met that challenge completely rewritten it and and I think it's a half decent piece of fiction and um, you know I'm, I'm, I'm reading back as I say I'll be with final touches as, as we speak and it's very very close to completion and uh, I'm obviously looking forward to to having that published and um, all mapped out uh, is about to be released in paperback and that will feature five new chapters of um, of the cities which uh, would come under the banner of unofficial cities but uh, but you visit these cities and and you talk to people in, in these places like Brecon and Rochester and Kent and there are a few that are unofficial cities that once were cities and the people they, they will not have it that they're no longer official cities so so I thought perhaps they deserved a little bit of a mention, and, uh, and there are some very, very funny stories from, from all of those cities, which was the, the, the whole idea of putting the book together in the first place. It sounds like um, that they're both, actually both reads in their own way are, um, are, are quite comical, but quite uplifting reads. Yeah, yeah, I've got actually a friend of mine who, who he actually bought a copy without telling me it all mapped out. And he phoned me up and he said, he said, you know, this is fantastic. He said, because it's not just like reading a book or a, an autobiography or a, a, you know, a work of fiction. He said, it's, it's actually a reference book. Um, he said, because I, if, if I just want to read about Canterbury, I can just look to see and I can read your story about Canterbury. He said, and, and, and then, you know, I can read your story about Wells in Somerset. He said, you don't have to read it in any particular order. So, and, you know, and I, thought, I thought that was great. He, he derived a lot of pleasure from that. Um, and also, you know, the, the, at the end of every chapter, I put my little, my little bit in, my, stick my oar in to the best pubs or the best curry houses, which are all essential to a, a travelling rock and roll. Oh, absolutely. The best pubs and the best curry houses. And I'm sure the best curry houses, um, Birmingham's got to be featuring there somewhere. Oh, Birmingham is in there. Yes, it is indeed. In fact, you know, there are a couple of quite funny stories. So one that involves a curry house in, I think it's actually Wolverhampton, not, not Birmingham. But, um, yeah, there's, there's some very, very amusing anecdotes and stories. Um, looking at it in the round, would you say you've, you found the music easier or the writing easier? Uh, I think perhaps I'm more of a, a, a natural uh, musician than a writer, but I think I probably I, I wanted to do some writing because I feel I do have an ability to to spin a decent yarn. You sound like you you sound like you can be quite hard on yourself though. But you sort of you started the third novel, you then decided actually no, I'm not quite on the right track. I'm going to do something a bit different. Would you say you're your own worst critic? Oh, without a doubt. I think I always have been musically as well. I listen to even to some of the, the hit songs that are still sort of aired quite regularly on, on the radio. And, you know, I listen, I sort of go, oh, you know, I should have done that again. And, you know, it, it is, it's, uh, I, I, I suppose, you know, I think you have to be. Uh, I mean, you know, in this day and age, um, people will record an album probably every three years. Now, you know, during the, the grand old 70s and, and 80s, we actually had to produce an album every single year. And we were performing about 100 dates out on the road each year. So uh, you, you learn how to grab. But um, it, it would have actually been quite nice to have done an album and to, to have actually um, spent rather a little more time being absolutely meticulous and, uh, and just achieving something you were totally happy with rather than something that you were fairly happy with. I understand you still manage the band, is that right? Yeah, I've been doing that since 1984, which, uh, which is astonishing. I, I was very, very fortunately born with a little bit of business acumen and it stood me in good stead. And, um, and even though I'm no longer with the band, I still sort of manage their affairs, although this, uh, this current period is um, well, once again, they're off the road and I, I don't think people will be mingling in theatres for, for quite some time to come. I, I can imagine that will probably be one of the last sort of uh, things to, to, to go back um, when they open pubs and 
start opening clubs, then I suppose theatres will, will come afterwards. But uh, yeah, in these extraordinary times, we, we, we really don't know. Although, you know, as we're speaking, I'm, I keep hearing these stories on the news of, about city centres being crowded again. And it's that actually, I find a little scary. I agree entirely. And, you know, I was reading yesterday that it could be as, as it could be you know, next year before we're getting theatres opened and, and getting sort of venues back together again. So it's tough for all the guys who are out of work right now, all the techs and the, and the musicians and the artists and the, the performers. You know, it must be really incredibly hard on them right now. It is really, really tough. You know, I'm speaking to most of the guys that I, I deal with on, on a regular basis. And they are particularly frustrated and obviously the government implemented the self-employed um, I, I, I don't know, quite know how that's going to work you know that's not being implemented until June so people basically had to struggle through three months before they got any money and, and musicians a lot of musicians that, that I know and, and book out on occasions they're not particularly wealthy people. They are very dedicated people, but it's um, it's it's a really really worrying time for so so many people that uh, that make their trade, uh, that you know ply their trade on the road doing whatever. If you're self-employed, it's very very tough. Indeed, I mean, you know, I hope. we're all having to take a, take a hit, but uh, ultimately we'll we'll come through it. We'll all come through it. Indeed, and I hope happier days come to us sooner rather than later. Just one last question for you. If you look back over the four, or five, over the four decades, have you got one real outstanding positive memory there? Oh, yeah, I have, yeah. Name dropping, again, I did actually float the name Bing Crosby. Um, I was very, very fortunate. Um, one, one day in the studio, uh, we, we used to record in a studio called the Music Centre in Wembley. And um, the, the, the guy uh, that, that owned and, and ran the studio, Lewis, uh, he had a very, very soft spot for me. And um, I was just a, a young, good looking lad at that time. And I, I went upstairs to, to grab a cup of tea and have a game with Paul. And he came rushing over and he said, Dave, 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 David, come and meet some people that you'll be delighted to meet them. And I said, I'm not going to have another game with Paul Luke and he said no no please come and meet them for me so I walked over and unbelievably sat on a sofa in the corner with Bing Crosby and Fred Astaire who'd been doing some recording in there was a, uh, the studio one in this complex was a massive studio a lot of artists like Shirley Bassey and some of, the, some of the really big names would go in there and record with a full sort of 40 piece orchestra which I think is what Bing and, and Fred had done. Anyway, Lewis introduced me to, to, to Bing Crosby and to, and to Fred Astaire. And, and Bing stood up and, uh, and he said to me, you know, young man, I saw you on top of the pops and was very impressed. And I went home to visit my parents the weekend afterwards. Now, my, my dad was never, ever impressed by Anything to do with show business, he wasn't. He wasn't interested at all in who I met or you know, all the excitement of, of the road. He wasn't really bothered about that. He was very proud that, that I was successful at my trade. But um, but we sat around the Sunday lunch timetable, um, chewing into a piece of Yorkshire pudding, and um, I said, "Oh, Dad, yeah, I I met that that guy who, who you really like uh, when I was recording the other day," and he said, well, who, "Who's that?" And I said, Bing Crosby. Anyway, his, his jaw dropped. His mouth just fell open. And he, he just looked at me. And he, he was most definitely impressed. And all, all he said to me was, after a, a long silence, he said, now he can sing. <laughs> oh, that's... That's a great yeah. story. Yeah, so he, uh, but it, you know, it was great to meet them. And they were such, they seemed to be such grounded people for, for two absolute legends. Because I know my, my mother particularly liked Fred Astaire as well. So, uh, so now I was, um, 
I, I think I, I, I earned a little bit of extra, extra respect that day from the parents. You sure did. And you've earned plenty of respect yourself over the years through your career. And um, I, for one, am privileged to have had a chat with you today. Dave Bartram, lovely to chat, lovely to meet. Glad you could come along and join us. Looking forward to the next book and the, 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 um, the, the, the reprint as well. Um, look after yourself, stay safe, and um, thanks very much. Thank you and everyone out there, be good.